Hi, everybody. Welcome to the November 1st, 2019 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get started with a uh, how local school districts handled this week's October surprise snowstorm. Some say the districts closed on the wrong day, and some point to the difficulty of predicting storms like that. Patty Calhoun from Westward, it's pretty easy to Monday morning quarterback this a couple days later, but what did you think of how DPS and the other major districts handled the snow this week? Well, judging from the screams going up from parents around my office, no one handled it very well because they had just sat down, fired up their computers, and suddenly found out on Tuesday that they had to go get their kids from DPS or they were going to be left out in a snowbank. So DPS didn't actually even hit its own schedule for when they say they're going to close schools. So they should might want to have a little refresher course in that. Michael Fields, Executive Director at Colorado Rising Action. You have a couple little ones yourself. As a parent, how did you, th you feel the school districts did? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, hindsight's 2020 on these all the time. I've also uh, been working at a school before when they make these decisions. Um, it tends to be group think, like, what is everybody else doing? And then that, you know, it tends to happen. But the, I think the early release is the worst thing that can happen because, you know, parents are at, at work. They have a certain time. They get their kids. Now they have to rush and pick them up. So I think it's better always to err on the side of, you know, canceling it early, getting the information out there. Eric Sodom, political analyst and now weekly columnist at uh, Colorado Politics. Uh, is this kind of a damn what they do, damn what they don't scenario? I think it is. Uh, I don't envy them. I'm glad I'm not in that position. I think uh, Michael's right in the sense that there's a group think and you follow what other districts are doing, et cetera. There's never a right answer, but probably the wrong answer is the midday dismissal that just complicates everything. I'm not sure it would have been a heck of a lot worse to wait until three o'clock as opposed to noon, although the storm was building. And then the other question is, did you need, after the storm it somewhat abated, did you need the snow day on Wednesday? Maybe I'm hopelessly old fashioned from walking uphill to school both directions <laughs> uh, in, in, in my era. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, a little more hardiness. I think we can uh, we're in Colorado. Let's cope with a little snow. <laughs> Natasha Gardner, articles editor at 5280, also a parent of a little one. Uh, uh, what did you think? And maybe this is a good dress rehearsal for what could be a snowy winter? Well, for me, as someone who grew up in North Dakota, it just felt like a nice fall day all week. So, <laughs> um, But perspective maybe comes into play there. I, you know, as, as people mentioned, this 2020 vision, you know, we certainly don't hold uh, weather forecasters to the same standards that we apparently are holding our school districts to for predicting storms. Um, but whenever we have the storms, I'm just I'm amazed by how much impact schools have on, on our city, whether that's employers, um, to the way our streets are plowed, to just what happens to businesses, local businesses, both who benefit and don't benefit from closures like this. Um, you know, thinking about the teachers who are struggling to get into work because they probably don't live near the school that they do, and we could do a whole show on affordable housing related to that, or, or the families that need the schools because it provides food for their kids. It's, a, it's a, an important place. It's a safe place for the kids during the day. There are so many roles that our school district play, or our schools play within this district. So it's always a good reminder of that. But yes, it was a scramble on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is a scramble I can relate to on uh, scheduling front for ours as well. Uh, election day is Tuesday, and there are some important statewide initiatives on the ballot. Proposition CC would allow the state to retain any surplus tax revenue in perpetuity. Proposition DD would legalize sports betting in Colorado and use the taxes for water development projects. Petty, it took a while for these campaigns to heat up, and I don't know if that's a sign, if it's just a slow season or that's, a bit, that's inherent with these propositions. What do you think? I think the national scene is still taking all the oxygen out of the room, but both DD and CC are beginning to get pretty hotly contested. DD is one where the only clear winner, if it passes, is going to be the gambling towns. They, I mean, they we're getting some things for Colorado Water Plan up to 29 million, which would be 10 percent of the casinos take on it. But they are clearly the winners, and whenever the casinos go to the ballot box. They seem to really know exactly how to play people. And really, what's, what's the harm for sports betting? Most people want it. It's not going to affect a lot of people. The only people who are really paying for it are the people who lose to the casinos. I'm guessing that'll probably pass. But if you go up to Blackhawk and remember what that town once looked like before limited stakes gambling went in, you can just guess how this will affect those towns. CC is going to be the one that will be a fight to the finish. I don't know if there's been any polling, but... People who, do, who still like Tabor do not like the idea of it going in perpetuity. And then there are a lot of people who look at the roads that they've been stuck on for the last five days and say, we need help here and in higher education. 
Michael, you've been a part of a lot of different Proposition CC debates on the no side, if I'm right. Uh, what have you, what, how's the attendance been at those debates? What has the reaction been? How's, how's being in the middle of the fight uh, been for you? Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, it's definitely a race to kind of define this, and without people paying much attention, uh, it, it has been interesting. Um, I think, you know, in certain areas, they're really into it. In Jefferson County, I've done probably half of the debates or forums uh, in, in Jefferson County, but all over the state, there's a lot of interest uh, for the people who are really in tune on one side or the other. Uh, I think, you know, the, the Denver Post had a really good article this week about the ballot language and how important that is for both DD and CC, but especially for CC when it starts without raising taxes. Taxes. You know, it doesn't say Tabor in it, it doesn't say permanent, it doesn't say refunds. Uh, and so I think that makes it so that people are looking into it more last second. Uh, turnout's been interesting so far, uh, pretty low turnout across the board. Uh, but I think this is going to be razor tight the way that Ref C was. It was a four point margin. Even when Tabor passed, it passed with 53% of the vote. So these votes tend to be pretty close, and I, I think it could go either way on election day. DD, I think momentum is on the pro side. Um, you know, there really isn't an opposition that is uh, coordinated uh, against it. And so I think, you know, you look at it, even with the low turnout, I, I, I predict that DD would pass. Eric, you look at the timing with Proposition CC, and there's part of this that feels to me that there's a lot of strategy and part of being coincidence. Uh, it's an off-year election, so there's going to be lower turnout. The campaign for this thing didn't start until, I want to say, like mid-September tops. I mean, it was uh, around this table we talked that it existed, but we really didn't know officially it existed. In fact, we didn't even do a debate here at Channel 12 because we didn't know until the middle of October that it was actually going to be a campaign. That may very well be to its advantage. Uh, I don't know if there's someone there, maybe Speaker Becker's thinking that uh, this was the plan all along. As you're looking at this so far, what do you think? Yeah, I wrote a column on it for Colorado Politics a, a couple weeks ago, and I was question. I mean, I was pointing out exactly what you did, Dominic, about. Uh, the low-key nature of this, I believe their, quote, campaign kickoff press conference for the proponents was on October 4th or 5th. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was an October date, uh, and I commented at the time, when you're doing a kickoff in October, two weeks before ballots are going out, there's really not a campaign. My question was, is there sort of a perverse genius behind this? I don't think this was the strategy from the get-go. I think they were forced into the strategy. But it may be a beneficial strategy. I think they're, I'm torn on, on CC. On DD, I really haven't followed it. I suspect Michael is right. I suspect it passes uh, simply because it seems like something for nothing and there's really not an opposition effort that's funded uh, uh, against it. On CC, on the one hand, you have very favorable ballot language, very attractive ballot language. If people just read the ballot and know nothing else, it is mom and apple pie stuff. Uh, on the other side, you have an off-year election and a really sleepy off-year election as, as they go with lower turnout. Um, and you have, at least the indications I'm seeing, is an electorate that is much more Republican than is typical than what the electorate is going to be November a year from now. Uh, you know, basically we have a third, a third, a third between Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated. Right now the Republicans are tracking at about 39 percent of the ballots. That number will go down as Election Day comes because Democrats tend to vote late, but it may only go down to maybe a 36 number. And if 36% if of the universe voting are Republicans, and if it tends to be an older vote, which it seems to be the pattern as well, uh, the CC could be in trouble. I, I think Michael is right, again, in the sense that it's going to be close. It will f pass narrowly or it will lose narrowly, and I'm not willing to put money on either side of those right now. Natasha, I've always said that water is one of the most important issues in Colorado that very few people want to talk about. Uh, they, they, they want their sprinklers to be able to water their lawn in the, in, the, in the summertime and not really worry about it, but it's still a huge issue for us, especially as fast as we're growing. Is that going to help DD pass? Is it, is it more about water and less about sports betting, or do I have it backwards? Uh, maybe a little bit of both. I think, uh, you know, I've covered water for, for years now, and the thing that almost automatically when you first talk to somebody who's an expert on water, their first concern is how few people realize how hard it is to get that mountain, the, that water way up in the mountains all the way down to our tap. And the, the amount of effort, whether that's, you know, sometimes federal projects to get that down, um, state agencies, um, utilities on a local level. And Colorado has spent a lot of time thinking about that, you know, dating back to the very first days of the state, but 
even recently with the, the Colorado Water Plan, um, the problem is we haven't had a dedicated wa uh, funding source for that. And that limits projects. It limits the future of that plan. Now, there are plenty of people who have opinions about the plan and whether it should be implemented the way that it's written and what that would look like and what those projects would look like. But this, if DD passes, would be an opportunity to start funding that. But ultimately, I think when people look at that ballot, they don't see water first. I think they see what the wording is about, which is about the Betty. In addition to the ballot issues, there are a lot of municipal elections on Tuesday's ballot, including the mayoral race in Colorado's third largest city, Aurora. Many school board races are breaking fundraising records and campaigns have become as contested and dirty as any federal race. Uh, Michael, to compare anything to a federal race is not going to be a compliment. So the school board races are uh, in, in, in difficult territory. And Aurora is facing a, a pretty big decision with uh, if it goes partisan, which officially it's, it's not partisan, but you have uh, two Republicans and Mike Kaufman and Ryan Frazier that could split that if they think that way. You have Omar Montgomery. Uh, you have a couple other candidates, but uh, it's going to be interesting to find out where that goes. Take your pick of all the different options here. What do you think? Yeah, well, one, I think that local races are very important, both ballot issue-wise, school board. You know, they make the, a lot of decisions on the school board level. I used to say, you know, the way school board was happening in Jeffco and Dugco back, you know, four, eight years ago, it was as hard as a Senate campaign uh, to do that. But I think these are the races that impact your life. The, the interesting thing is, you know, in presidential years, you have 72% of the people that vote. Uh, last year you had 62, this year you might have 33%. And so these issues that really matter to people, uh, not a lot of people vote. But I think in Aurora, that's probably the most interesting one with the mayoral race. It's not a, you know, it's not a runoff like it is in Denver, and so you just have to get a plurality of the vote. And, and looking at it, Kaufman uh, is clearly the front runner, but he's well known in that area. But a lot of people don't like him. A lot of people do. There's a lot of strong opinions about him. He's not obviously not a Trump fan. And so then you have some of the, less, the lower candidates like Marsha Burgeons going after him, saying, you know, that you're not uh, Trump enough. And then Omar, uh, you know, is a Democrat, but wasn't really a heavy hitter going into this. And this is kind of their option right now. And so he, I think, is picking up steam at the end here. And then Ryan Frazier is well known, uh, you know, in, in the area, too. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see, can anybody go and catch Kaufman uh, during this? But school board are also really interesting in DPS and other places. So I'll be watching the local stuff almost as much as those statewide ballot initiatives. Eric, a big marriage race to the east, the school board races, breaking all kinds of fundraising records all over town. Take your pick. I think I'll focus on the Denver school board race, which has become just unbelievably hot, unbelievably nasty, unbelievably expensive. You have a candidate in the southeast Denver district, not even the city at large, and one-fifth of the city who put in about $350,000 of his own money. Uh, I mean, to self-fund, I mean, I understand self-funders, if you're going to walk, oh, well, let's look at our governor. You know, you spend 20, 30 million dollars and you get to be governor of the state for four years. Maybe there's a return on investment there. What is the return on investment on, on buying a seat? This is a gentleman by the name of Scott Balderman, um, who's the teacher union candidate in southeast Denver, and he's put in you know, going on $400,000 total, including what he's given to some other candidates. It, it, it boggles the mind. Uh, my disgrace last week was some of the mailings that have been put out against a couple of the Latina female uh, uh, Hispanic candidates, Alexis uh, Menacal Harrigan, Diana Romero Candle, where they've tried to take away their Latina identity and even anglicize or whitewash their faces to make him look less Latina. It's just uh, despicable stuff. But the fact that these are contested, Denver has been a district that has generally been very reform friendly and reform candidates have won these seats, not easily, but with uh, not narrow margins for um, you know the better part of the last decade or two. And, and just the fact that the results are unknown now uh, and the battle is really engaged tells you that uh, the tide has churned a little bit in terms of public opinion. Natasha, looking at the different municipal elections and the school board races, what's the most striking story that's come out in your eyes? Well, I think that the conversations that started sort of earlier this year with the municipal election in Denver are continuing on a larger area, uh, larger scale in the metro, um, but also still in Denver as well. And we're seeing that in the school board. Um, as mentioned, the Aurora race is going to be very interesting. I had a chance to interview all those candidates. Um, they have some similarities and a lot of differences as well. One clarification, Ryan Frazier is um, unaffiliated and has Thank been you. for um, a period of time. Looking at the school board race, um, there's an at-large position, so everyone in Denver is going to have a chance to vote for that and the big topics of reform, 
what's good, what what's, works in our school district, um, charter schools, choice. These are topics that are only rising in urgency in the conversations around town and they are at the forefront in all of these um, contests. But and then don't forget, there's other language on the ballot as well related to, say, um, creating this Department of Transportation and a few other minor tweaks. So people um, may be apathetic in these sort of elections and not go to vote. I have a feeling that people watching the show probably are voting, but maybe this is a reminder to go out there and get some other people to vote because there are plenty of topics that are going to impact every level of our city and our state on the, on the ballot this year. Patty, what do all the movers and shakers that you regularly hang out with uh, say that's going to happen for, with all these different races? They're saying nothing, I have to say right now. <laughs> but think about a snowstorm basically got Mayor McNichols out of office, and you wonder how much the snowstorm and the people who were very upset about the school, school cancellations, non-cancellations, that could actually have an effect on incumbents, especially in the, in the various school districts. The fact that a couple different counties are looking at debrucing measures, more municipalities are looking at debrucing measures, that might have an effect on CC too, because it'll bring some people out to vote who might not have. Aurora is really going to be one to watch. I think it's going to be unlikely that Kaufman is beat, but that will depend a lot on the turnout. The town I'm going to be watching is Lakewood. Don't forget that Lakewood had that big anti-growth thing pass, even though they were inc incredibly outspent on it by the people who wanted to keep the status quo. That is a suburb that is booming into a city now, not unlike Aurora. And the mayor, who I think is doing a pretty good job, Adam Paul, is being challenged. It's gotten very ugly in Aurora, and that's going to be a big fight on Tuesday. This week, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Economy Act. The act would establish approximately 400,000 acres in Colorado's wilderness, recreation, and conservation areas. The bill highlighted the divide between Colorado's congressional delegation as no Colorado Republican representatives nor Senator Cory Gardner supported the bill. The bill is unlikely to pass the Senate and President Trump has already threatened to veto. Eric, we, we know the fate of the bill already, but it seems that the arguments, I mean, the, the floor of the House of Representatives was, <laughs> was front and center of the really pretty far divide between the Democrats and Republicans that represent the state of Colorado. Uh, what did you think of from what we saw uh, of the, of the arguments for and against this bill? Well, first of all, I have to comment on the title of the bill. I think there's a whole new industry out there that, you know, the mom and apple pie, which I already referenced earlier, industry that names these bills. What is it? The Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act with a, with a nice acronym of CORE. Uh, a lot of people are sort of throwing barbs around of which side of this debate is out of touch. This bill was sponsored by Senator Bennett and, and Congressman Neguse. And, you know, their supporters would say the opponents, the Scott Tiptons, the Cory Gardners of the world, are just hopelessly out of touch. In my mind, the whole thing is indicative of the divide in this country and the divide in this state. And both sides are representing their constituencies. They just happen to have different constituencies. Uh, the, the constituency in favor of this bill is a lot of outdoor users, outdoor businesses, outdoor industry. Um, and, and, and the opponents of this bill are people who believe in multiple uses of these lands, including ranching, including some degree of uh, energy extraction, et cetera. You just have different visions of what this state is and different economic interests as well, and both sides are representing their constituencies. Natasha, uh, Representative Scott Tipton voted no on this, uh, even though it would have impacted a great part of his, a great deal of his district. Do you think he'll regret that? Is this going to become a voting, uh, an ad issue next year? I think every point that is mentioned in this act is something we're going to discuss for many, many more years. Um, and, and then that's that's how important it is. It makes sense for that reason. We're having lots of conversations in the state right now about how we use land, what we use it for. And even that, that question of use, it's it's us taking and taking something from the land and how we, how we interact with it. So all of these conversations are important. What I was relieved to see was that this was news coming out of Washington to see that we so quintessential Colorado. These are the important conversations that we should be talking about at this table. Um, you know, one of the elements in there is designating Camp Hale as a national historic landscape. You know, there, there are just lots of nuggets in this bundle of a very large package, and that's a problem is the large package has so many different elements, and people are going to disagree with certain elements of that package, but there are some really interesting um, aspects that I think are worth, the, worth discussion, hopefully going forward. Patty, we don't get a lot of uh, bills in D.C. named after Colorado, so this uh, made some headlines, at least here. Are we going to continue to see stories about this as we get into the election season? 
Well, of course Trump will veto it if it passes the Senate because it's going to get in the way of the wall he wants to build in this state. So that'll happen. I'm with Natasha on this Camp Hale thing, which is so fascinating. It would be the first national historic landscape created in the country. The story of Camp Hale is really wonderful. No one can disagree that what happened during World War II when they were training the skiing troops was remarkable. It would be, they've been talking about creating a land, this landscape um, category for like eight years, and it's gotten to this point, and you know it's not going to make it through this time, which is too bad. Also in this bill, 200,000 acres that would be taken off for drilling, they would be put off, off bounds for drilling. That is also a good thing in Colorado, but I don't think we'll see this pass. Michael, wrap it up for us. Was this a 10% of teapot, or is this going to be something bigger next year? Well, I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion. Uh, I don't know how this gets done or if it should get done without Scott Tipton uh, being on board. I think him and Gardner both came out and said that they're open to it if there's certain amendments that are done on it. And I think that's a reasonable position. I think Scott Tipton knows his district really well, knows what's best on this issue. And so I think, you know, if he signed off on something, I think you would see Gardner and, and perhaps the president, uh, you know, looking at it. But, you know, given where it is right now, the president said he'd veto it, that the Senate's not going to pass it. I think it's back to the House. Dems and if they want anything done or nothing done at all. And so I think this will yeah, continue on uh, next year and maybe into the future. Let's get to our favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. As always, Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. The long-awaited report on the explosion in Firestone, which showed that that flow line had they built the subdivision knowing full well that had not been capped, it had not been cut off. We're going to have flow line discussions coming up with the Oil and Gas Commission pretty soon. And people, including the widow of the, the, who lost her brother and her husband in that explosion and has had, what, 27 surgeries, Aaron Martinez says it's time not just to cap these flow lines, but to pull them out altogether once they're obsolete. Michael. Um, proponents of the national popular vote raised $750,000 over this last reporting period, 97% of which came from out of state, uh, mostly California. And so I thought it was interesting that the whole claim was we don't want to give our vote away to California, and then all the money came in from there. So I don't know who thought of that, but it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Eric. I'll make myself the disgrace of the week here on the show uh, seven days ago. We were joking. I think the quick take topic was about Donald Trump's uh, Colorado wall. And I ventured to thought that, you know, maybe we, we shouldn't jump to conclusions that it's a wall on our southern border. Maybe it's a wall to keep Wyoming uh, folks out of Colorado. I mentioned that our good friend, former person around this table, Dan Haley, was a Wyoming guy who maybe we were wanting to keep out of the state. I was wrong about that. Dan is a proud uh, Denver native <laughs> who just has a particular affinity for Wyoming and particularly University of Wyoming football. So... Uh, I'm a purveyor of fake news. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha. Uh, in the worst sort of not fake news, waking up this morning, there were reports in Chicago of a seven-year-old who was shot while out trick-or-treating. Gun violence in this country is a conversation we, we consistently have around this table. A seven-year-old getting shot on any day is an awful, awful thing, but on a holiday that's truly about the spirit of, of kids being able to go out and the tricks and the treats and, and all that fun, um, it's just a really sad, sad headline. Time to say something nice about somebody. Patty? Well, let me just quickly add on the wall, I spoke to Tom Tancredo, former uh, denizen at this table, who is now involved with the We Build the Wall campaign down on the border. And he suggested that he would be all for a border, not around Colorado, but blocking, not Wyoming's okay, New Mexico's okay, blocking off California. <laughs> but that is not my, uh, that's not my nice, that's just an addition. It's Denver Arts Week, start of Denver Arts Week. Lots of great events, including free night at the museums on November 2nd, which is a great way to see many, many places around town. And also Day of the Dead today and tomorrow. But get down to Santa Fe Drive. It's really a remarkable spot. Michael. Um, there's legislation coming next year uh, to change our uh, license plates back to the green mountains and white sky. It might be a small thing, but I do like that one a little bit more, so I wanted to give credit to the legislatures bringing, legislatures bringing that forward. Going old school. I like it. Eric. How about the World Series? That was fun. Here, great, here. great World Series. Seven games. The underdogs won. Uh, and happy birthday to my mother, 92 years old, Marion Sonderman, a regular viewer of this program. Happy birthday. Well, happy birthday to Eric's mommy. That's fantastic. And it was cool at the World Series. I saw this. Out of all the different sports that go to seven games, hockey, baseball, and uh, basketball, 1,400 series have taken place. Not one of them until now where all the road teams won. Kind of crazy. 
Natasha. All the attention that has come out in recent weeks about Justina Ford, Denver's first black female um, physician. I mean, talking about a woman who has had an impact on this city. She uh, delivered nearly 7,000 babies. So if you just sort of extrapolate upon their families and the influence that, that that has had on this town, it's amazing. But last week too, I had an out of town guest and I took him to the Molly Brown house. I'm a big fan of Margaret Brown. Everyone pretty much knows that already. But one of the things I told him is that the reason that was important to me was that as a girl visiting there, it was a museum dedicated to a woman and how cool that was and how thankful I was that we live in a time where that's not so unusual anymore. So love that she's getting the attention that she deserves and that that museum's going to have some um, more funds. And that they have a really cool Christmas thing. They, you can go there because they have a kind of seasonal change in the Molly Brown House. So I, I can't echo that enough. I think that's a great point. A couple of things before we go tonight. Uh, first, the bad weather this week canceled our both sides of the tapings, uh, both sides of the story tapings, as try as we may, it, was, it got a little crazy. So the semifinals officially begin next Friday. They're going to start earlier tonight. They'll begin next Friday with Rhea Scaria from Mountain Vista and Haley Stotts from Eagle Crest as they debate if Colorado Public Schools should have armed guards present throughout the school day. Also, I want to remind everybody that Colorado Gives Day is December 10th, and now it's all the, all the, the lines are open, and you can officially schedule your <laughs> gift to CPT12 right now. You count on us for great programming like Colorado Inside Out, and hopefully can we count on you for your support for Colorado Gives Day. Go to CPT12.org for details. And again, uh, thank you so much for your support of us throughout the year, but we count on your support for Colorado Gives Day, and we're hoping that you'll be able to uh, say, yeah, this is, I like to see the different programs like Colorado Inside Out. Maybe you're even fans of uh, Devil's Advocate with John Caldera. I know at least he is, so I, you know he's out there maybe thinking about that. But all the different programs that we do here, whether it's Street Level, Sounds on 29th, or all the great PBS programs that you tune in for are all made possible by you. So thank you for your support in making that happen. And please do go to CPT12.org for more details. For everybody here at CPT12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.